Chapter Twenty Five of Two Thousand Miles Below by Charles Willard Diffin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Smitty. Scarcely more than a vault in the solid rock, the room where Rawson lay. He had seen it for an instant when the priest, after tying his hands behind him, had hurled him viciously into the room. It had but one entrance, though up high on one wall was a crack some two feet in width that admitted fresh air. A little room, only some twenty feet square. But he would not suffocate. The priest did not intend that he should die. Not yet. He saw one of the giant yellow workers bring a big metal plate. He put it before the doorway. Then, by the red glow, he knew that they had sealed him in. I got fee -e all, he thought. I did that much to help. That may put a crimp in their plans, check the invasion up above. But Gore didn't do as I told him, or it didn't work. The twenty-four hours must have gone by. Then even in that thought he found happiness. That means Loa is safe, he told himself. The shaft is clear. She's on her way back right now. He pictured the jana falling swiftly through that dark shaft. He saw in his mind the beautiful figure of the girl, lithe and slender, standing at the controls. About him was a silence like that of the grave. His blood pounded in his temples like a throbbing drum. It was some time before he knew that, with that throbbing, other faint sounds were mingled. They came from the wall beside him, sharp tappings, muffled by distance, the faintest whispering echo of rock striking upon rock. Tap, tap, tap. A longer pause. Tap. They were making dots and dashes that blurred with the beating in his own brain. In that dreadful silence he strained every nerve in an agony of listening. There was nothing more. He had been roughly handled by the savages. His whole body was bruised and aching, his thoughts hazy and blurred. Woozy, he told himself. Guess the old bean must have got a bad crack. Hearing things mustn't do that. Again he tried to picture the girl, speeding on toward that inner world. Was she thinking of him? Surely she was. He could hear her calling his name. Dean, she was saying. Dean San. The words were repeated, an agonized ghostly whisper, repeated again. Dean San. Oh, Dean San. Before he knew that the sound was coming from overhead. Then a light flashed once in the little room, and he saw her face looking down. She was beside him an instant later. Dean San, she was saying, did you think that I really would leave you? She was pressing her lips to his. Uncovering her light, she worked frenziedly at the metal cords that bound his wrists, pausing only to repeat her caresses, and at last he was free. I reached the jana, she told him in hurried whispers, and then I came up. Their great room, where the pathway to the light begins, was deserted. With a cord I pulled the lever, and the jana vanished. I could not leave it for them to use. Then I followed. I knew by the sounds where they were taking you. And now, what can we do, Dean San? Where can we go? It was real. Loa was there beside him. He had her in his arms. His bruised, bleeding arms, whose hurts he no longer felt. And then, through his mind, flashed the question. If this was real, what of the other? The rappings he had heard. Perhaps it hadn't been a dream. He lifted a fragment of rock and crashed it against the wall from which the rappings apparently had come. Laboriously, he spelled out his name, remembering the dots and dashes from earlier flying days when planes had been equipped with key senders. He spelled it slowly and waited while only the silence beat upon him and the blood pounded in his ears. Then he heard it. The answer came from a quicker hand. Rawson, this is Smitty. But Smitty was dead. What could it mean? Slowly, Rawson pounded out the letters of his question. Where are you? The answer dispelled his last doubt as to the reality of what he had heard. It was Smitty. Others were with him, for Smitty said we, and they were prisoners, 
sealed up in a living tomb. But where? Smitty did not know. He knew only that they were in a big room where the rocks had been shattered and molten gold spilled on the floor. There was a hole in the roof, but too small to get through, a round hole about eight inches in diameter. And at that, Rawson interrupted to tap out a single word. Coming, he said, and turned toward Loa and the light. The girl had found a metal rope in her wanderings. She had used it to let herself down into the cave. And now it was she who helped Dean to pull his bruised body up and into the narrow crack. Loa had clung to the flamethrower. They found it where she had left it above. The tapping rocks she could not understand, but she knew Dean had a definite plan in mind when he whispered, "'The room where you first found me. Do you remember? Do you know the way?' "'I will always remember,' she said simply. "'And yes, I know the way.' Rawson caught glimpses now and again of that broad thoroughfare along which he had once traveled, a prisoner of the Mole Men. But Loa knew other and seldom used passages that roughly paralleled it, and then, after a time, Rawson himself knew in what direction they must go. He knew, too, that they had followed a circular route, and that the room in which he had been sealed was not a great way from the place in which Smitty was a prisoner. Yet this had been his only way to reach it. When they came to a sudden sharp turn, he realized that they were close. Beyond that bend would be the branching lateral tunnel that led to Smitty's prison. The main runway had been deserted by the Reds. Stopping often to listen, starting at times into side passages at some fancied alarm, they had met with no opposition. But now, from beyond the angling passage, came the familiar shrillness of the Mole Men's voices. Again, the two concealed themselves, but no one approached. "'It's a guard we hear,' Rawson whispered. "'They're guarding that entrance where we must go. They're taking no chances on Smitty's escaping.' Then he crept to the point where the passage turned, the flamethrower ready in his hand. He drew back. For the moment it seemed to him physically impossible to turn this weapon upon them, they were savages, true, but it seemed horrible to slash living bodies with a weapon like this. Then he thought of the devastation those same weapons had wrought among the people of his own world. His momentary hesitation vanished. With one spring he leaped into the open, where a hundred feet away red bodies were massed, and the air above was quivering with the green jets of their weapons. His own flamethrower he had turned to a tiny point of light, and now it roared forth in fury as he swung it forward. They had no time even to aim their weapons or to turn them on. They were stampeded by the astounding attack, and still Rawson sickened as he saw them fall. There were some who, panic-stricken, dropped their cylinders and leaped for safety in a narrow, branching way. Rawson knew he should have killed them, knew it in the instant that they vanished, but that momentary, uncontrollable revulsion within him had stayed his hand. He rushed forward now, Loa still bravely at his side, past the fallen bodies, through the choking odor of burned flesh. Grabbing up one of the weapons that had been dropped, he thrust it into her hands and said, "'Wait here. Stand them off if they come back.' Then he was rushing up the side corridor, toward a room where once, in a far distant past, he himself had been confined. The flamethrower lighted the way. It showed him the metal plate and the smooth, glassy rock that had been melted around its edge. He pounded on the metal and shouted Smitty's name. Voices answered from within, voices almost unintelligible for the wonder and unbelief and joy that made them a confusion of wordless shouts. Then he stepped back and turned the blast of his weapon upon the rock at the edge of the plate. The metal sheet moved at last, its top swinging slowly outward. Its base was held by the gummy, hardening rock. Then it broke free and crashed to the floor, and the light of Dean's weapon showed through the black opening upon the blanched faces of men, whose eyes were still wide in disbelief. Though they were looking at one of their own kind, it must have taken them a moment to realize that the naked body, 
clad only in a golden loincloth, and the hands that held one of the fearful green-flamed weapons were those of a human. Then one of them broke from the others, sprang heedlessly across the still-glowing plate, and threw his arms about the barbaric figure. "'Dean,' he choked. "'Dean, is it really you? You're alive?' And Rawson's voice, too, was husky as he said, "'Smitty, I thought you were gone. The radio said they had got you, old man.' The other khaki-clad bodies, a dozen of them, were crowding through the hot portal, and Rawson came suddenly to himself. "'Quick!' he shouted. "'They'll be after us in a second. Follow me.' Loa was waiting. Her own flamethrower spat a little jet of green. It was the only light. Rawson saw here she had gathered up the other weapons and had turned them off, so that even their little light would not blind her as she kept watch down the dark passage." "'Do we want them?' Dean shouted to the others, and Smitty echoed the question. "'Do we want them, Colonel?' Colonel Culver, his face almost unrecognizable under its smears of powder stains and blood, snapped a quick answer. "'No. We outrange them with our rifles. They're only flamethrowers, not ray projectors. Beat it. Run like the devil.' Rawson snatched Loa's weapon and threw it with the others. It would be hard going ahead. She must not be uselessly burdened. But he kept his own. Then, with his one free hand, he swept her up till she was racing beside him as they led the way. I should have kept the fire weapon, the girl protested. I, too, can fight. Rawson, speaking between breaths, reassured her. Too heavy. Their guns will protect us. Behind them, a man's voice cried out once, a single, hoarse scream of agony. Then the rock wall took the sharp crackle of rifle fire and threw the sound into crashing, thundering echoes. End of chapter 25